Hi, everyone. Welcome to season five of Radical Embodiment, the podcast. I'm your host, Emily Wishall. I'm a certified welfare embodiment coach and author. And today I have the pleasure of bringing you Professor Lori Nimitz. Lori and I met um, earlier this year back in June while I was attending as a student her dissection lab um, with KNM Labs. Um, so she co-led the lab along with Leslie Kamenoff. Um, it was a fresh cadaver dissection lab. If you've been listening to my podcast, you heard me talk about it on here. It was an incredibly profound, transformative experience for me. And I was deeply impressed by Lori just as a teacher, um, her ability to just really teach and lead from a genuine state of curiosity. And um, so I was excited to get to have her on the podcast and get to connect deeper in this way. So Lori is a um, adjunct professor at Pace University. Um, in 2020, she received the Pace President's Award honoree for outstanding contribution. She's also a visiting associate professor at the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Rush University Medical Center in the dissections and movement experiences. She's currently working on her PhD um, in contemporary anatomy studies at Eastern Virginia Medical School, which is fascinating. And she's author of the book, The Myofascial System in Form and Movement. That book is linked in the show notes. I highly encourage you if you're someone who's wanting to learn about the fascial system, about movement, to check it out because um, it's really a tangible way to learn. So clearly, Lori has a rich and eclectic background in movement and anatomy. She also is a um, dance movement therapist. So she has her master's in that. So she is such a wide, diverse wealth of knowledge, of wisdom, specifically on the human body. Um, so it was a gift to get to have her on the podcast and get to hear and share with you all some of her wisdom. So I hope that you enjoy the interview. Hi, everyone. Here I am with Professor Lori Nimitz. Lori, hi. Hi. Um, I'm so, I'm really, really just like delighted to have you here and genuinely like so curious where this conversation is going to take us. And I know I'm going to have a lot of, gain a lot of insights um, from and from you. So thank you for, for being here and for sharing with us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here as well. Um, so we always start with the question of what embodiment means to you. All right. And yeah, that's a big one. Um, it's also interesting because as we've been chatting a little bit, mm -hmm. I I kind of predate embodiment. <laughs> that sounds funny. It sounds like I'm that really sounds funny. I like that um, though. <laughs> but coming from the background dance movement therapy, which I got my master's degree kind of in the, the early mid 90s now so it's been a while um I predate that word and not the concept though because mm -hmm. I think the concept whatever we call it um has been around for a while and it's words are interesting so I like it as a term to actually bring together some of the things a lot of us have been thinking in different fields and different places for a while so embodiment to me is really <laughs> being in the body, which isn't so simple either, because it's like, what is a body and how do we describe that? Is the body when, and this this gets into, because you know me as a dissector, as well as some of my other hats that I, I play. The most like beautiful, <laughs> artful dissection that I think is probably possible. <laughs> Watching <laughs> Lori dissect and like, this is, it might be like, wait, what? Like, I'm someone who like, I get queasy if I have blood drawn or like a shot. <laughs> but watching Lori dissect is like a meditation. Yeah. Thank like you. Beautiful. And actually, I think that comes from my own art and dance background mm -hmm. that I, you know, I mean, that body, which is no longer embodied <laughs> the mm -hmm. same way that we're doing our practice is still a um, something to be respected profoundly. Mm -hmm. So I think I treat that in my dissections. Um, but getting back to the talking about embodiment, um, you know, it's it's being for me personally, it's being very present in the here and now in my own body system. So um, getting that kind of connection all together with where I'm at, being present. And, you know, I teach 
I teach at a university, teach two different universities. One of the things I teach besides anatomy is yoga that I've done for a very, very long time. And my yoga students in the universities, it is harder and harder to, um, I think, be embodied because we have so many distractions all the time. So part of you mean practices, mindfulness, um, you know, yoga, dance movement therapy, all these things are about actually being embodied and, and actually taking that um, in the present and really finding how you're living and connecting with this body. Because body is one thing physically, but then soul, spirit, life force, all of those things, how does that fit into that vessel? And then how do you express it back out into the world? Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm curious to go into the, your dance movement therapy background and how kind of what led you in that pathway, especially, you know, my imagination when you did that, that was a newer field or not a lot of folks were talking about that. Um, um, so it's interesting. And it still isn't that well known as a field, which is a shame because it, it's um, makes so much sense. It was already mm-hmm. Um, a couple decades old as a formalized field when I came into it, um, but still isn't heard about as much as maybe music therapy or arts therapy, all of those things. But it had been around for a little while and it actually came out of the modern dance movement. So a lot of people may know that like Martha Graham, big modern dance name, she also studied Jungian psychology. So a lot of like her students and a lot of the people that came out of that modern dance world, not just from Graham, but other places as well, were exploring movement and dance as a means of expression, not just a means of performance, which that was a really big thing. And it was actually one of my aunts who gave me Trudy Shoops, I think that's the right name of her, her last name. Will You, Won't You Join the Dance, which was the first dance movement therapy book um, that I read was about a dance movement therapist who worked in Switzerland. And she utilized, I mean, mime and all sorts of other things working on a psychiatric unit. And this kind of fascinated me, like, you know, because I was at that stage, I had worked at the American Dance Festival, but I was highly academic. Like, what do I do? Do I, you know, perform and dance? Do I... Um, go into something more academic? Do I, you know, what do I do? And I, you know, I went on to college first, art history and French. Um, And then from there, at the same time, I was kind of prepping myself for background um, for dance movement therapy, keeping this kind of in the back of my mind. And I just was fascinated with this field that um, was exploring movement for the sake of health, not movement for the sake of performance or looking a certain way or having to perform a certain way. And that's it for your career. So I became really fascinated um, with dance movement therapy. And I think also just, I I know you're very uh, centered on, you know, how for women, especially how we can kind of put ourselves out in the world. And at that time, we often think of dance as being, oh, well, you know, that's not very progressive. But at the time, modern dance and these dance movement therapists were highly progressive in their fields because they were the ones sometimes working in a world that didn't have a lot of women taking those stances, especially in like psychotherapy. So um, I kind of resonated with that. I was divided between going to art conservation (laughs) and into dance movement therapy when I reached that bridge. I keep exploring new things. I think you know this, but they all keep connecting. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was kind of what hooked me in was just like, wow, I, because I, at the time I liked choreography. I still do some choreography. And I was like the expressive nature of being able to do that for health. That made a lot of sense to me. And we have the body first. This really makes sense to me. You know, you get art, Therapy, music therapy, all these things are wonderful, but it's one step removed from embodied. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, to me, the dance movement therapy made absolute sense. Um, so I, I got into that field kind of early on. Yeah. Amazing. And I just love that, like, mm-hmm. 
even to think because this was this early 90s is early nice? 90s was yeah when I graduated um, college and went into grad school 94 I think was when I finished up grad school my master's degree part of and my perspective at least of the 90s is also at least in like American culture is like hardcore diet centric like everything sugar-free everything fat-free <laughs> like, um it, you know Not I don't well, know it, <laughs> yeah like just like cardio, cardio, you know, to look, it was at least, you know, that was, those were the years I was, I was growing up too. And so maybe that's part of like why that influences me is so much as like the nineties was like intense diet culture, but I think it's such a beautiful distinction. And so important just to like reiterate a name of what you saw and what intrigued you in the, that field is yeah. movement as an act of expression and for health versus mm -hmm. performance or aesthetic or to try to look some way. Right. Um, very right. different in underlying motivation. Absolutely. That I think shifts the express, like I'm trying to think of expression, but that I think shifts the movement, the inherentness of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it was interesting. I'll, I'll share something very, you know, personal during that time period too, was when I was in grad school, I've been in two car accidents in my life, but <laughs> I'll share this right out there. Cause I do sometimes mm -hmm. I mean, with yoga students and everything else, once, and I was on a way to a rehearsal um, with a dance troupe when we were struck by a car going sideways through a red light. And I, it, it took, you know, here I was in a program for dance movement therapy. I was really starting to learn and, you know, get deep into yoga practice. And I got hit hard the next day. I felt like I had been run over by a train um, and I had to learn how to balance again. I had to learn how to do everything again and not take my body for granted. And then, I mean, shortly after, and that was down in Baltimore, and shortly after my husband and I moved early on in our marriage up to um, New York, also struck <laughs> struck on my way to work post 9-11, where I was working trauma therapy, um, but I was struck by somebody who fell asleep at the wheel and my trunk hit into the front of my car. And again, I was pulled out um, and put on a gurney and told I might not walk again, mm. which is again, for somebody who is a mover and a whatever. And I had to once again, work through um, pain to work through movement to work through what what is my body? What does it do for me? What you know, all of those sorts of things. So a lot of people have these stories. I'm kind of sharing that because a lot of us have at some point in our life something that has happened that has kind of almost threatened the the body <laughs> schema or whatever you want to call it. And yet we have to refigure out what that means to be in it or how to climb back out of it or how to, you know, change things so that you work with where you're at. So I just kind of throw that out there too for, you know. Yeah, I appreciate you. <laughs> sharing, sharing with your audience. Um, yeah. Sometimes we don't. Yeah. And do you, and do you mind, like, if you can, you know, walk yourself back in, into either of the times when you were in school or even like the post 9-11 of, and just whatever comes to mind is kind of a bigger, you know, intense question, but of, of, do you recall how you supported yourself in, in relearning how to how to balance how to be with that question what what is my body where, where am I at in my body of what that process was like for you yeah I think um and that's a really good one and I, I have talked about this in my past before but post 9 11 so I was in that car accident I'll add to the story my husband was out of work right before 9 11 I had two small kids. My my oldest was a little bit older. My youngest was around six months at the time. So there was a lot going on. Plus, I was a therapist for other people dealing with 9-11 trauma, but I was living in the area that we we're de dealing with 9-11 trauma as well. Um, I swam. <laughs> One of the places that I actually taught yoga um, for and had been a long, long time um, I, I actually took to swimming because it was mm -hmm. a place where everything else kind of shut out. I was not in as much physical pain. I could be able to do laps and be able to be calmed by a rhythm. And I think I've always needed that. 
um, during these last few years, which have been entertaining too <laughs> for everybody, um, I walked religiously and I still do. Um, today is raining and pouring. It's a very rare day that evening with the rain, I'm not out on the trail, but these days walking often is my go-to five miles a day, first thing in the morning um, to feel myself and to feel myself very present embodied. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of where, you know, and, and I think too, anybody who, you can speak to this as well, but anybody who um, works modality of the body kind of needs to practice that for themselves as well. You know, and I get body work. I've sometimes done exchanges, sometimes it's just paid out right for it, whatever has worked um, in different scenarios, but I know you can't do everything yourself as much as we want to. So that's mm -hmm. also been part of it where you can put that into, um, but you absolutely have to do that self-care. You can't just talk about it. You have to do it. Um, and, you know, I mean, if it's imperfectly, um, like I said, I, you know, and I tell other people too, I live in an area where we don't have trails right on our street, but we have a lot accessible nearby. I always have many pairs of shoes in my car for every mm. type of weather so that I am not only my regular time is set aside in the morning, but if I'm happen to be by a beautiful trail or have a few minutes, I, I don't have an excuse for not, you know, getting out there. I have extra jackets for every type of weather. Yeah. So, you know, it, it makes it um, easier to then not have those excuses if you prep mm. yourself for making that like a habit, like brushing your teeth or meditation or any of that. Yeah. I think that's great. I think that like practicality is great of anything that like, if you know, there's something that really helps bring you back into your body, helps bring you into the present moment, helps soften you, which I think nature for me is a huge Absolutely. regulator. It's essential for me to be out every day, but how can we make those barriers of entry just a little, little less, a little mm -hmm. less so that when we're in those moments and opportunity, it's like, okay, I can do that. Even if it's for yeah. five, 10 minutes, that can be a huge shift and the, how you feel and perceive yourself Absolutely. and your environment through the rest of your day. It never astounded to amaze me what five minutes can do. Five minutes yeah. of breathing. I just set an alarm, you know, and just it sh can shift your state. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So, so uh, I could ask you so many questions on this, <laughs> but I really want to dive into your work in dissection and fascia because that's such a personal interest in me. And I also... <laughs> really have this belief. Um, so I'm curious what you might have to say or think on this because you're way more the expert. You are the expert in this field. Um, I, I have this belief that our fascia health really influences our emotional well-being. Um, and so, yeah, so, so kind of, you know, if you don't mind taking us, you can start there or um, where I'm also curious is how did you kind of get into this world of dissection being from dance movement therapy that um and into this world of of fashion was fascia you know because of the dissection and yeah yeah that's a really great question um i actually jumped into kind of this whole world fascia anatomy deeper all of that um right after my master's degree or maybe kind of during it because I had I had required courses in anatomy and kinesiology, and they were with this amazing person, Peter Madden, who has passed away a number of years ago. He was a, a lab on movement analysis and guy and expert and also really amazing choreographer, amazing person. Um, but we had a kind of a cursory course in anatomy and kinesiology. And I still kept thinking, as amazing as he was, as amazing as some of the other work that we had done was, I, I started working almost immediately um, some different special needs populations and, and nothing matched the books. Mm -hmm. The postures didn't match, the bodies didn't match. My friends, my own body didn't match the books. So I was like, well, I have a big curiosity because, you know, you pull out a classic anatomy book 
and it looks like everything should look like this. And then I was working populations where, you know, shoulder blades didn't hang the same way or, you know, all of these sorts of things. I'm going, what's going on? And things that shouldn't have been anatomically possible sometimes were in these bodies. So I had a curiosity to what was it, you mean, physically, emotionally, that um, people were working with to make, you know, maybe another part of their body take over for a missing limb or for cerebral palsy or for an emotional state that was really different. So I, I kind of started diving into looking for that. Um, I, you know, started looking kind of more esoteric anatomy books and digging into anatomy of movement, Blanding Calais book, or, you know, some of these other esoteric books. And I did find um, Tom Meyer's first edition of his book, right kind of when he came out with it. And at the time he was doing um, a 200 hour course very early on in, in body, you know, movement and ideas with this. So I kind of took a dive in that way. And a lot of, a lot of people know, I kind of have known Tom for over 20 years. I was anatomy trains faculty for about a decade, <laughs> both as a dissector and faculty teaching. Um, but it gave me a lot of new ways of thinking about things. So there was this mysterious fascia, which had been talked about in my books, but it was thoracolumbar fascia. It wasn't looking at connection. Connection made sense to me holistically. It made sense to me to start to um, think of things relating to each other, because that's what we do in the body. You know, at this point, too, I'm looking at many different systems. And, you know, there's some of Tom's work that works lovely holding up to theory. And some of it is much more um, a good idea. <laughs> I have both of those in there. And I'm, I'm, you know, respect all of that as his thought process. Um, but I think I, it really did open me up to this whole world of um, work. And it actually was Tom that initially told me, go study first with Gil. And so I did wow. for a while. Mm -hmm. I took a deep dive um, doing dissection work with him. I then I Gil is Gil Headley. Yeah, Gil Headley. Um, yeah, a lot of your He's going to be on this same season <laughs> podcast. He's gonna... Okay, cool, cool, cool. And he's doing a lot of great work. And um, I also, but simultaneously, I went to a program at um, Mount Sinai in New York, mm -hmm. very different style mm -hmm. of anatomy. And so I started to dive in deeply. And like I said, I assisted to some of the dissections anatomy trains for 10 years, worked on the fascia net plastination project, started to work other little things. Can you speak what that is, the fascia net? Yes. And that was done with I think most people know about Body Worlds that does the big plastinets and mm -hmm. the displays um, all around the world. So we paired up with Body mm -hmm. Worlds to create the first kind of full body plastinate, um, which is dissected donor that becomes plastinated. So it can be permanently displayed, but highlighting fascia. So, you know, there's no easy way to do all of this. Um, but we highlighted some of the different ideas in fascia, some of the different thinkers in there in different ways, um, so that your mind shifts from just looking at, okay, muscle, bone, yes. nervous system, those are all great. We need mm -hmm. to have all these different viewpoints, but also to have one that's more fascially organized and to think about what that might mean for movement, for connection, mm -hmm. for the body. So I, yeah, I was part of that project, um, both as a team member dissecting, I helped teach some of the workshops. And then I was also at uh, Rush Medical teaching mm -hmm. dissection, fossil dissection to some of the medical students. And also that was really quite fun and interesting. Um, I had to learn how to speak language to jump over into some of these different worlds, but then to show something new which I think is another subset of what I, I love to do is communication with other people so that we can have conversations in interesting places. So that's yeah. kind of got me diving in deeply. I mean, I, you know, heads off too. to, I learned a lot from Todd Garcia, who still works both independently and with um, Tom in, in labs. Uh, he's got tremendous skill set. 
I, you know, Vladimir at, at the Plastinarium, um, just amazing amount of scientific knowledge. I've, you know, Carla I've hung out with and now do some things um, as far as working on different committees together. And she's got an amazing um, set of knowledge. And we all kind of um, are finding different ways to to do this work. And I I love that it can, you know, dissection is not just memorization. It's also sometimes very much artistic choices. And mm. what viewpoint are you choosing to reveal? So mm. um, that's been something that for me, again, is is very important. As, as you mentioned before, I'd like to do kind of very artistic <laughs> style dissections. So it's it's partly respect for that body donor, but it's also what is chosen to be revealed so that we can mm -hmm. see different ahas and connection that may give us ideas of what we can take back to our clients, to ourselves, um, into that. That's a really profound gift that donors give back to us. Their body is not embodied, but they mm -hmm. give us ideas of how to embody our own living bodies much more profoundly. I think that's an amazing gift. Such an amazing gift. I don't, I'm like tearing up probably because I'm like remembering <laughs> that lab and it was my only, I'd been in cadaver labs before. I'd never actually dissected and I'd never been with fresh cadavers. Mm -hmm. And it was just such a profound experience that week. And, and I remember, you know, it ended on a Friday, that Saturday morning, I was in my office with clients and having just this set like the my first client when she was walking and I was just watching her move this like completely new sense came over my body and my system um yeah. that was because of seeing the donor bodies and getting to be with them to the deepest levels all week um which is yeah so incredible and for your audience I'll explain in there too that this was KM Labs this is the work I do yes with um, yeah. Leslie Kamenoff, which Leslie I've known as well. I think we go back about uh, 30 years, maybe three decades in the yoga world. And mm -hmm. we had been long looking for ways to kind of work together and be able to do stuff. So those labs, when we do them, we have the movement piece, the experiential, the um, piece, of both kind of in both of our styles of yoga practice too. So that not only are we taking the work in lab, but we have at least three devoted times to movement practices so that we can already start to see how that kind of fits into our own bodies and how we might take that out into the world. Yeah. Yeah. Just so incredible. And it makes so much mm -hmm. sense. That, like, I love that you guys have the movement come part. It feels so yeah. like it feels essential. I mean, it's the only way that I know it, but it was, yeah. So incredible to take what we just saw and then feel it in our own body. Um, a question I'm curious about for you, because I feel like you have such distinct populations you work with, and I like that, or at least that you teach. And I like how you shared what's important to you is communication and kind of working with these fields mm -hmm. to communicate so we can like communicate and have conversations across fields. What would you say if there is a difference or, you know, what comes up for you first with this question of, you know, when you're teaching medical students versus, you know, when you're experiencing like with k and labs, with movement practitioners, what, where, you know, are there some distinct differences? Are there some overlaps that you like might not expect with those kind of two different populations? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think it comes down to kind of anyhow, people are people at the bottom line of everything. However, their um, language is different. So it's very much the same way that um, if I go to France or if I go to a different country, it helps to, you can have more conversations open up if you speak the language, you mean part of it. And language is not just the verbal language, it's the nonverbal cues as well. That goes medical, that goes movement people, that goes language, you know, France, culture, those sorts of things. And that sort of um, piece of things, like I mentioned to you, I actually, I did spend a year transferring into a French university so I can speak to some of the language stuff. Language is not my natural, um, easy thing to come into, but I find it fascinating. And I think that's part of the reason I did it. Um, and it's made me think ever since about how to communicate 
in different ways with different people um, because you know, you kind of know like you've made it in a different culture or language when you can tell a joke in that <laughs> culture and it comes across or, you know, you have sure, a sim yeah. similar You're sense. You're not just laughing because like you're, yeah. you're getting it so incorrectly. <laughs> that's um, my, that's how I am in, in language. <laughs> Usually I'm just smiling because I'm so incorrect. Everyone's laughing. That's okay as well. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so when, you know, and I've, I've really thought about this aspect of science communication. In fact, you know, um, last Fashion Research Congress, I presented with my friend David Lasandak and Rebecca Pratt mm -hmm. on science communication, because we're all kind of passionate about, you know, it's great to have all sorts of knowledge, but if you can't express it or can't share it across different groups, what's the point of that knowledge? So I'm I'm kind of always fascinated with that. And I think I think learning some of the language is a matter of respect and also knowing what you know and what you don't know. You know, I trust me, I I bought the really big, thick, heavy anatomy books, and I've I've kind of come into anatomy quite sideways, but I've I've gotten enough to know what I know well and also to know where I can say I don't know how you guys approach this. I'm interested in learning. This is, you know, where I'm coming from, but have enough of the language points so that we can have a common, common place to have a conversation from. So I think yeah. that's always important. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I'd also love to just hear, you know, how, how many years have you been doing dissection now for? It's been a while. A long time. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's okay. I mean, you don't know. Yeah. So you've been doing it for a long time. You've seen, I'm sure, hundreds of different bodies. And yeah. How yeah. has how is your experience with that? And and with all of your other experience, you know, being in being a teacher with the students, with the the donor bodies, um, with that movement therapy, you know, background of how has that influenced, you know, first your own relationship with your body? Um, you know, do you notice, you know, does it shift daily actions or movement or has that made you more steadfast in your walking and has, have you seen that shift then also, you know, students when they're in that environment shift kind of how they relate to themselves even. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I think too, as far as dissection, I also try to get people to have a curiosity about people's stories, but not again, not say we know for certain what happened. Even if I read on, you know, somebody's death certificate, they died of X, Y, and Z, that doesn't tell me, were they happy in their relationship with their kids? Were they, um, you know, a generous person? And did they love, you know, walking outside when they were a little kid? Did they, you know, it doesn't tell everything of a story. So even if we see a body in lab and we go, oh, wow, they had this um, surgery and this and that, or, oh, they were a smoker, they must have, you know, these horrible lungs, I'll never smoke. Sometimes those are some reactions that can happen, but there's also, and I think you guys experienced this as well, just how much goes on that's really beautiful and goes on well. You know, yeah. um, in the body, a lot <laughs> in lab, yeah. in all the labs I've ever worked in or been in on my, on my own, too, that um, you're seeing somebody's remains on their least viable day. And yet, look how much is beautiful in yeah. that body, gorgeous and profound. So, when we honor that, that gives us permission to honor ourselves a lot more. Hardly a body that I've seen that, you know, uh, doesn't have a scar, doesn't have an injury or doesn't have something going on. And yet how amazing sometimes the choices the body makes to continue mm. and to be strong. Like, hey, wow, this little artery skirted around because, you know, something else was going on. So it decided to make its own pathway or wow, a lot of scar tissue here. But obviously this person wanted to move even around a traumatic injury that didn't get worked on. And they look how strong they were over here. So the push towards growth, towards wellness is really strong in people. 
Mm. Really strong. And I, I just think as a therapist, I've honored this. As somebody who is a dissector, I've tried to honor this. And in other areas of teaching, that if we remember that, mm. um, we work towards growth and wellness instead of looking at diagnosis and what's wrong. I really, yeah, I could get on a soapbox. I won't go completely, but about um, medical care right now, especially in the States, mm -hmm. is so siloed right now into individual parts. And I know even for myself, for my loved ones, something gets on your record incorrectly of a medication or a diagnosis that is incorrect, but it like can't be corrected because so-and-so supervisor hasn't corrected it correctly in the system. And forevermore, you might have mm. that in your records and be a label. We're not mm. labels, we're people. And I think the more we give ourselves permission to feel that embodied in ourselves, the healthier we'll be. Um, we have to get beyond labels. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's in there. I love that. I so believe that. I think that's important. And that's such a beautiful takeaway from seeing inside the body, how resilient our body really is and how our bodies. Exactly. Yeah. I, I really believe our bodies are always wanting to move towards balance and health. Yeah. It's just input. And and I think attitude and perception is, is, yep. a, is a big piece of that. Yeah. We sometimes get stuck. Systems sometimes get stuck, but the general yeah. desire is towards that growth. So the more we do for that, the more we do for other people to get that pathway clear, how beautiful that is, mm -hmm. you know, both on an individual level and then as a society, a community, a world system, you know, I'm big on the world word system these days, because I really, it can scale up or scale down quite profoundly. And it's health of a system. To me, that's really important. <laughs> so speaking of health of a system, can we talk about myofascia? And I feel yeah. like you have a whole book on myofascia and movement and <laughs> one like background. I don't think you know this probably about me, but how I got even into rolfing, how I figured like not figured it, but first learned about fascia is through, and for the people who don't know the term myofascial just means like muscle and fascia. So it's the, the fascia mm -hmm. around the muscle. Um, which is stunning. It's gorgeous. I was like, I did not expect to look inside the human body and be like, what's so beautiful. It is. <laughs> I was like, I was more like, I'm going to faint and throw up. <laughs> so I was like, this and is you so did beautiful. not, you did I not. I didn't, I did not. Um, but so I was going to go into the physical therapy route and my last semester of college, I had a full-time internship with a PT who did myofascial release. She had studied from John Barnes and was lucky being undergraduate intern that I learned hands-on technique. I was with her in every session. Um, and that's how I really discovered beginning of discovering fascia before that it was fascia connective tissue. That was it. No conversation. Um, and I feel like you definitely, yeah. So, so do you mind just, this is just kind of an open ended question, just speaking to that and, and what it looks like in the human body and what it is and, and how it impacts our system of, of, of movement and mm -hmm. of health. Yeah, and different people that yeah actually became part of the name of my book, The Myofascial System and Form and Movement, um, <laughs> which I do have a copy of Andy nearby because <laughs> I happen to have it. And it's been translated into other languages. It started to be translated, um, That's which amazing. is pretty cool. Very but um, the idea of, as you said, myo is muscle, fascia is fascia which in itself is a form of connective tissue that we keep changing and tweaking the definition so I'll just say that for now but looking at the two together I think also is important I've been thinking about this more I mean since the book has been published we have myofascial connections systems you know of all different sorts that have been mapped out and are interesting ones to play with and to look at in terms of functionality. You don't dissect a body and immediately come to them color-coded. You, you have to decide to make a choice to make those connections, but they can have a lot of relevance. They definitely you know, have been how I play with a lot of thinking about my clients. 
So that in itself is, um, I think, something important when we use those words together. But we also, myofascia is kind of interesting because we do need the muscle along with the fascia because they train differently. And we need both to kind of work together um, for optimal levels of the human body. We all know that if, you know, especially I, I work a lot with um, college students and if they train too explosively in a new area of sports their muscles will train very quickly but their fascia hasn't caught up and it's the fascia that will tear um, because it hasn't had enough time to change it, its shape likewise if you have somebody very mobile you also do need sometimes some of the muscular strength in order to keep that body system in check so mm -hmm. even taking a look at some of this through the science, through the movement, all of that together can kind of get us um, smarter ways of how to work with the body. And since you do a lot, especially with women, this has become a big area of study in the science, especially people like Carla Stecco's group and uh, Katerina Fede, F-E-D-E, -E, is doing a lot of work on women's hormones and fascia. So mm -hmm. as we age, perimenopause, menopausal ages, for example, too, has become a really big thing because women don't just disappear as they get older, <laughs> but their, their needs sometimes have to change a little bit with the understanding of what's changing in the fascia. So mm -hmm. understanding that there may be more achiness or that this is even the time to get more into working the body for resiliency is really important. Um, so I think that that's just the teaser I'll, I'll put in there about the myofascial system. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll hold off on, on more <laughs> questions there, but, um, and so let's kind of segue just, just so we kind of have your, you know, not full journey, but spectrum, because you're now working on your PhD. Um, and I think in a concept that's topic that's really intriguing and fascinating. So do you mind just sharing kind of what you're working on and yeah. Yeah, I just started. This is um, with Eastern Virginia Medical School and I'm doing part-time so I can manage all the other crazy things in my life. Um, and it's a late in life PhD, but you know, I, I don't think there should be any cap on learning or when these things um, come into play. I'm, you know, I'm not looking to turn this into exactly my new career, but I'm looking to have it help and enhance the dissection work that I already do, which is educationally minded. So this is um, my PhD as a concentration in contemporary human anatomy, which that in itself sold me on its, this program. I'm like contemporary human anatomy. And we're looking at um, different aspects of that, not, you know, not only writing a high level PhD dissertation and everything else, but also, you know, learning all the different ways. But again, it's for me to be able to speak the language better mm -hmm. with other people in that field, to have a seat at the table in some places where movement folks, where, you know, kind of fascia anatomy folks don't often um, get those seats. So the more of us who can do that, the more, the more conversations hopefully are sparking. And I'm taking a look at particularly right now, my, my final dissertation may change, but on basically art history, dissection, um, visual literacy, all of those things combined together in how we, um, how we train and educate I mean, in medical school and everything else. So there's a lot of programs being done right now um, in museums of having doctors look at paintings for clues mm -hmm. and context. I think this is fascinating. Mm -hmm. I am fascinated by looking at old historical works, particularly, I mean, from the Renaissance or the wax museums, where that level of detail changed then how we did the next round of medical education or anything else. Like where fascia, I mean, appeared in um, art history, in, in the anatomical drawings and where it disappeared and why. Yeah. So I'm kind of looking at all of those things because mm -hmm. perception matters. What we see changes, as you well know, even from dissection lab, 
changes what we do, how we work, how we um, interact with people. So that's, that's part of the work I'm doing in my thesis. I love that. You know, part of when I first um, had the desire of asking you to be on this podcast, I was like, maybe I'll just have Lori talk about the history of anatomy and art history of, of <laughs> we can do that too sometimes. <laughs> Because when you, I remember being in lab and there was one morning, I think we were, you know, it was just conversational. We had not quite started officially and you were just naming off all. And I was like, whoa, I was like, I'm so fascinated by that. And even what you just named, you know, when there was fascia on images and then when that was taken out and when it was brought mm -hmm. back, it's always very curious the why behind that. And it does shift yeah. just what we see, how we orient, like you say in, yeah. in, in dissections you know, how you're dissecting is also going to shift what the end result, what you're seeing, how you're viewing, how you're perceiving. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, for sure. So what would you, to kind of wrap us up, um, share for somebody who wants to, you know, live a more embodied life, who wants to, you know, be able to be more in their body on a daily basis. Um, do you have any suggestions or practices that come to mind? Um, definitely prior prioritize yourself at some point because we really can't reach out there and help everybody else if we're not coming from a place that feels okay ourselves so like I said I you know I mean it, it's almost almost without fail I would say 350 something days out of the year <laughs> out of the three, um, I am on that trail every single morning and I do it for myself. I'm not usually an early bird by nature, but I do it for myself in the morning to, to, to get that in for myself, to set the stage before the rest of the day goes on. Um, you have sometimes more time than you realize. It's how you prioritize it. Um, you'll see sometimes too, I mean, though I do love to connect to people on social media and we'll probably share that in a moment that I do take breaks too. You mm. mean for things like that, where it's like tough week, mm. lot going on, shutting down. I know you've done that too, mm. where you mean took, I, I heard you, you took time off of the podcast to take care of yourself this summer. Unplanned. So, yeah, Unplanned. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. sometimes it's needed. So yes. listening into that, but I would say start small with something very doable. It doesn't mm. have to be like, I'm going to sit in meditation for an hour every day. That's crazy. You mm -hmm. can start small and it's, mm -hmm. it's like brushing your teeth. You do it. If you didn't do it, you'd feel the effects. It yeah. doesn't take very long, but um, it's that habit that builds up over time. So mm -hmm. make you, your body, your embodied personality um, worth it. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's important and it can be simple. Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to be sitting stagnant for an hour, right? That just <laughs> doesn't really appeal to me. I'm like sitting on a bouncy ball as we're talking. I know. I'm actually sitting on a little foam cushion too, Are so you? I can go around for yeah, both of like, to say. Yeah. Um, so Lori, where can folks find out more about you? And then I would love for you too to also just read say the title of your book. Um, so people can find that, which I would recommend anyone, especially if, like it's, it's so accessible. You don't need to be a practitioner or know about fascia in the field. It's really, Lori's book is really like, it's, it's tangible, practical, and it, it's accessible. I think. To Thank you. Thank you. And I'll, I'll hold it up. Hopefully it reads. And, yeah. It'll be, that'll be on the YouTube. People can see that, but on the podcast, they won't see, they won't see. All it. right. So I'll read it for those of you who aren't just the podcast, which I know um, you have, it's the myofascial system. Yeah in form and movement. And mm -hmm. it is readily available, especially if you're in the States, probably the easiest place is Amazon. Mm -hmm. But you can also, if you're an indie book person, you can request that your bookstore order that for you. And I've recommended to people too, they were like, well, how can I get it out to other people? Um, buy a copy, you know, talk to your local library first, but buy a copy for your local library. Or your favorite program, if you're part of a manual, you know, school or something like that, buy it for your school and leave it out and have more people um, get that accessibility. Because like you said, I, I wanted it to be picked up by almost anyone and or uh, anyone, <laughs> a person with a body, um, you know, and it has some of the references. It has some of the details. So you can dive in 
to different levels of it. You can dive in. I have a lot of guest writers in there too and um, pictures so that if you are intrigued by some of what they say, go follow them. I want the community to be bigger. So I used a lot of my friends in this book as well. So, and then as far as finding me, um, uh, as far as website, um, www, I don't need to say that anymore, but I still do see how old fashioned I am, um, wellnessbridge.com. And I do update on there because I don't have mailing lists right now. I, I just don't, <laughs> I have one, but it's, I rarely send things out from it. So best thing to do is periodically look on that. Um, I update as far as new labs experiences going on. I also do occasional labs with anatomic excellence. That's all on there if there's something coming on. Um, and Facebook under my name, I think you'll send all the links and show notes. Yeah, I'll have it all linked in the show notes. So it'll and I do fun. have strangely three Instagram accounts, but you have one three is Instagram my general. <laughs> yes, I do. Oh um, wow! I'll send those to you if you don't have them all. Maybe I follow. Maybe I don't. Yeah, I'm. Impressed. Yeah, because the wellness bridge is usually what you'll see all my nature shots and a couple other things from my life. Um, mm -hmm. I have one that's more focused on the book. I think it's just the myofascial system, something or whatever. And then I have one that's anatomy bridge. And that one, I do more of those historic images of art and anatomy. So if you dig that, there's a I whole do. other little account for you there. And yeah, we'll share that. that in the show notes. Cool. I love that. I didn't know you have that. I'm like so happy <laughs> to know that. I do. And yeah. Facebook, I'm under Lori Nevitz and, you know, all of those things. Those are my main ones. Cool. Um, so, yeah. Great. Uh, well, Lori, thank you so much for being here, for your time, for taking the time out. We're, we're recording this on early on a Monday morning and um, <laughs> I'm just so grateful. I'm just so inspired by you, especially your continual learning journey. And you have just a genuine sense of, I mean, you're, you're just a kind, humble human, but you have so much to me, in, intelligence and expertise in this field. And um, thank you. I, I, yeah. Thank you for being here and sharing with us with all my listeners. Well, thank you for you and for your podcast. Um, I love what you're doing here and, and sharing, you know, yourself and also connecting people as well. I think it's so important. So thank you so much. And thanks to all your listeners. Okay. Awesome. Thanks everyone for tuning in and take care.